Why am I standing in a parking lot? Parking lots and our autonomous driving future, next on Now You Know. I thought we'd start off this series about the future of self-driving, autonomous, electric, zero-emission cars in a parking lot for the very reason that it's not sexy. In fact, it's rather dull, right? Parking lots get overlooked. They're everywhere, and yet we don't really see them. When we read science fiction stories and watch movies about the future, we never talk about parking lots. I mean, what is a parking lot anyway? They started popping up in the early 1900s as a place to temporarily store cars while their passengers are off doing something else like working or having lunch or meeting friends. That is to say, it's a place that is dedicated to storing cars while we do something else. And by its very definition, it has to be relatively close to that something else. 30% of urban traffic is caused by drivers looking for a parking space. And let's face it, no matter what you try to do, no matter how nice and new the asphalt or bright the lines, parking lots are not pretty. They're eyesores. And if the parking has to be close to the places that people want to go, like the housing, and the shopping, then we're forced to take up huge areas of valuable space just to park our cars. And because they're in valuable areas, parking isn't cheap. 95% of the time, our cars are not even being used. Think about that for a second. The average American spends $12,000 a year to own a car that they only use 5% of the time. On average, in one week, which is 168 hours, you're only using your car for about eight hours. The rest of the time, or 160 hours, is just sitting there, taking up space. Valuable space. Now come with me and let's peek into the future for a moment. In the not too distant future, cars will drive themselves. We'll be talking a lot about that in this series, how they're gonna do it and all that, but for now, just trust me, everywhere you look, cars will drive themselves. Now when cars drive themselves, a whole bunch of things start to happen. Things that are hard to imagine until you start imagining them. So let's start imagining. Okay, so it's Friday evening after work, and Jesse here wants to go from his suburban house into the city 25 miles away to see a concert and then have dinner with friends. Oh, that's right. I forgot that when we start time traveling, we split the time continuum in two. Well, that's all right. We'll follow both paths simultaneously. Jesse on the left is in the present, and Jesse on the right is in the future. In both time periods, Jesse starts by contacting his friends to schedule when and where they're going to meet. In the present, Jesse has one friend who wants to carpool because she hates going into the city and having to find and pay for parking. In the future, it's similar. His friend will come pick him up, but not because she has to worry about parking in the city. That problem doesn't exist anymore. She'll come to Jesse's house so they can spend time together on the ride into the city. Now, you're probably starting to notice the differences. See, Jesse in the present is still waiting for his friend to arrive, while future Jesse is already speeding along into the city. This isn't because his future friend left any earlier. It's because future autonomous cars can travel faster and experience no traffic. We'll get into that in future episodes. So now we see in the present that by the time Jesse's friend arrives from 10 miles away, future Jesse is well on his way into the city. Now we see that future Jesse gets dropped off with his friend in front of the concert venue. His other friends arrive in front of the concert venue at the same time because they are all using an app – that hasn't been invented yet – that coordinates their autonomous cars. And because of this technology, they can all meet at exactly the same time and at the same place even though they are coming from different directions because the cars talk to each other. Meanwhile, present Jesse is stuck in rush hour traffic, muttering to himself about being late and worrying about parking and then finding his friends and getting to the show on time. Also, he has to contend with all the people texting while driving and angry motorists beeping and just the general chaos of city driving. Future Jesse doesn't have to park the car or pay for parking. 
The car he just used is now free to go pick up someone else, and using sophisticated software, it will go to the nearest person in need of a ride. Let's pause here in the future. A future with no parking lots. Can you even imagine that? What does that mean? It means we can have a completely different reality. All this land and parking garages and infrastructure, all these on-street parking spaces that were used to temporarily store cars, can now be put to better use. So how much space are we talking about anyway? Well, in a new book, Rethinking a Lot, The Design and Culture of Parking, by Aaron Ben-Joseph, an MIT landscape architecture and planning professor, we learn that there are 500 million surface parking lots in the U.S. alone. Some cities have parking lots that take up one-third of all the land area. One-third! Let's take a closer look at this fairly common American icon, the shopping mall. By the way, there's over 100,000 shopping centers in the U.S. To get a better look, let's get a bird's eye view. To make this shopping mall economically feasible, the developer had to buy enough land to park all the cars for all the people that would visit the mall. So instead of buying 640,000 square feet of land for the mall itself, they had to buy 2.3 million square feet and build an enormous 1.6 million square foot parking lot with multiple entrances and ring roads to reach all those different parking spaces. So this is just one shopping mall. So how much space do these parking spaces take up if we look at the whole country, at the whole world? It's hard to get an exact number of the parking spaces in the U.S., but Professor Ben Joseph says that a safe estimate is that there are 500 million. A typical parking lot space is 9 feet by 18 feet. Now let's do a little math. The average space allotted to parking, which includes not just the 9 by 18 foot space, but also the space to get in and out of the space, is 250 square feet. So, 500 million times 250 square feet, and we get a big number. We get a whopping 2,905 square miles. That's 400 square miles larger than the state of Delaware. Okay, I can hear you now. Many of you are saying, who cares really? I mean, we've got more space than that in our whole country. Heck, we've got states like Nebraska and South Dakota that have lots of space and relatively few people. But here's the thing. Parking in, say, LA isn't the same as parking in North Dakota. Parking by its very nature has to be close by, or what's the point? In fact, take a look at this chart of the growing number of parking spaces in LA. In 2010, there were over 18 million parking spaces. There were 10 million people in LA, so that's almost two parking spaces for every person. And there is a cost to all that space being devoted to parking for cars. Let's see what it is. The average parking lot space costs $4,000, and that's just to build it. In an above ground parking structure, that cost goes up to $20,000 per space. In a below ground parking garage, that cost goes up to over $34,000 per space. And again, that's just to build the spaces. To maintain the spaces, like painting, repaving, repairs, snow plowing, and parking attendance, etc., costs an estimated $700 to $4,000 per space per year. One study estimates that parking in the U.S. costs us all $500 billion a year. That's more than three times what we spend on public roads. For every dollar we spend on our private cars, we spend 50 cents in parking costs. That cost could spread to all of us, whether you have to pay directly for parking or when you are buying items or services at a store and have to pay a premium for all the parking provided by that business. And housing costs are affected by parking spaces too, because remember that developers have to buy more land to provide more parking spaces. In fact, one study estimates that each additional residential parking space effectively increases the cost of U.S. urban housing units by $85,000 per unit. And it costs our environment too, because the construction and maintenance of parking spaces and structures consumes large quantities of energy and outputs significant emissions of greenhouse gases from the production of asphalt, concrete, and steel. In the future, if we took just a third of that space, remember Delaware, and we covered it with trees, that new green space would be able to handle 2 billion cubic meters of stormwater runoff, generate 
822,000 tons of oxygen and remove 1.2 million tons of carbon dioxide annually. If we use a very conservative figure of 10 watts per square foot, then putting solar panels in these 500 million parking spaces could generate 810 gigawatts of electricity. That's about the total electricity used by the U.S. last year. In U.S. cities, it's estimated that there are over eight parking spaces for every car. What if we took all that extra space and used it for people and plants and parks? Paving land for parking means that we create more heat islands, we reduce green space, we have more impervious surfaces which have stormwater management costs, and overall parking spaces just don't look good. I mean, which would you rather see out your window at work? This? Or this? In fact, almost all of us on this planet share this one thing in common. Stop for a moment and take a look out the window and I bet you can see parking spaces. Now, imagine this. There will be a day, not too far from now, when you will look out that same window and those parking spaces won't be there anymore.